Hi, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for this virtual event, Positively One of a Kind, The Creation and Care of Daguerreotypes. And I know we still have some people trickling in, but um, we have a lot to cover today. So I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Kelly Kress. I am the Senior Accessioning Archivist here at the Huntington, and this event is part of an ongoing webinar series produced by the Library's Reader Services Department called the Multi-Storied Library. I want to give a quick shout out to the Multi-Storied Library team of Stephanie Arias, and Blacksmith, Cynthia Captine, Natalie Lawler, and Holly Mendenhall, and thank them for all of their hard work on this program. And also a quick thanks to Dave and Mikey for the tech help today. I should mention that this presentation is being recorded and will be available later on on the Huntington's website. Today's attendees will also receive an email with links to the recorded presentation and companion research guide. Attendees are welcome to post questions in the Q&A and we'll answer them at the end of the presentations. Today we'll be discussing daguerreotypes, an early photographic process that's increasingly popular today as an artistic medium. Our panelists will talk about how daguerreotypes are made and what makes them unique, and also reveal what's involved in cataloging and caring for them. You'll also be treated to many fascinating examples of historic and contemporary daguerreotypes in the Huntington's collections. We're joined today by our four fabulous panelists. Lindy Lettinen is curator of photography. She received her BA in art history from the University of Chicago and holds both master's and PhD degrees in art history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Lindy has been at the Huntington for almost two years and previously worked for several museums, including the Getty, the Skirball Cultural Center, and the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. Suzanne Odie is processing archivist for visual and special collections materials. She has a degree in information science from UCLA and has worked in the Huntington Photographic Archives for 15 years. Previously, she was photo librarian and archivist at the Los Angeles Times. Jessamy Glor is lead paper conservator. She has a BA in biochemistry from Mills College and an MA in paper conservation from Northumbria University in Great Britain. Jessamy has worked at the Huntington since 2012 and was also an intern back in 2007. She also worked as a paper and photograph conservator in Scotland and at the English Her and the, sorry at the English Heritage Archives and had internships at the British Museum and the Seattle Art Museum. And finally, Iberian X Perello is special projects photographer. He has worked in Huntington's digital collections and imaging services department since 2019. He has over 30 years of experience in the photographic industry as a magazine editor and is the author of half a dozen books on the subject of photography. Since 2006, he has served as the host and producer of the Candid Frame podcast and has produced over 600 episodes of conversations with photographers, including Mary Ellen Mark, Joel Myrowitz, Keith Carter, and Maggie Staber. He has also served as an adjunct professor at the Art Center College of Design and has led photography workshops throughout the United States as well as abroad in countries including South Africa, France, and Japan. So let's go ahead and, I'm sorry, let's go ahead and get started and I will now turn it over to Lindy. Thank you so much, Kelly, and thanks everyone for joining us today. I am the curator of photography here and I come across a lot of different types of photography. Most of it as prints uh, within archives and albums or in books, but for today's talk, I want to discuss this unique history and process of the daguerreotype, the earliest and, in my mind, most magical form of photography. Let's move to the next slide. But before I go into some of the technical stuff, I thought I'd start with my first engagement with the daguerreotype here at the Huntington, just to show you what it is to try to view this object. So that's me on the left during my first week on the job, clumsily trying to photograph a daguerreotype with my smartphone. You can just make out the man's ghostly head on the back of my cell phone case. Um, on the right is the actual image of the daguerreotype. Um, you can that has been imaged expertly by our team here, and you can better see there the crispness, crispness and the level of detail. This is an 1850 portrait of Lyman Beecher, who was the father of Harriet Beecher Stowe, the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. <clears throat> 
And it was made by Southworth and Haas, a well-known daguerreotype studio and partnership in Boston. The first thing you might notice um, is how reflective the surface is, just like a mirror. This is because it's a highly polished silver-coated copper plate, a unique photograph that exhibits extraordinary detail and three-dimensionality. I've actually uh, had a story where a high school student last year saw a daguerreotype in person for the first time and exclaimed, is that high def? You know, because that is that is the experience that you have when you see something like this in person. That's the impression it makes. Daguerreotypes were often called mirrors with memory because of this reflective quality and the connection that you can make with the person depicted. You see yourself at the same time as you see the person in the image, and it makes you part of the object in some way. Some people have even referred to it as a kind of time travel, which I think is quite lovely. Daguerreotypes allowed many families to pose um, and, and to also have images of their loved ones for the first time. And Americans in particular flocked to have their portraits made. This became known as daguerreotype mania. And up to 3 million daguerreotypes, primarily portraits, but also images of buildings, landmarks, and city and village scenes were produced in the U.S. each year. It is a very arduous process with toxic chemicals, and that's part of why it's very intimidating both to do as well as to understand. It's part art, part science, part technology, part alchemy. Next slide. So the invention of the daguerreotype was first announced in Paris on August 19th, 1839. The French chemist Louis-Jacques Mandé de Guerre invented the technique, and here is the publication which we have in the library about his process with de Guerre himself illustrated there. This groundbreaking manual captured the imagination of the public. Shortly after it was presented, the process spread around the world with prominent daguerreotypists working in Europe, the UK, and the US. Next slide. So how are these made? Here's a diagram that I want to take you through, please bear with me, <laughs> with each step of the production, um, starting with the upper left and then following the arrows to the lower right. So a daguerreotype starts with a silver coated copper plate that's cleaned and buffed to produce this mirror like surface. The plate is then faced down in a box um, filled with iodine and then bromine, which react with the silver to make the plate light sensitive. The plate's removed and then you put it in a holder for a camera, which you see there in the center of the drawing. And then once the focus is set, the photo is taken by removing the lens cap to let the light in. Now, depending on the sensitization, the lighting, the size of the plate and the lens, the exposure time could actually range from a few seconds to several minutes. The lens cap was then put on um, or put back on to stop the exposure and the plate is taken out of the camera. To develop the image, the plate is exposed to mercury fumes in a separate apparatus. You see that on the lower left of the drawing. The developed plate now needs to be fixed um, with hypo or sodium thiosulfate, basically a, a salt water, <laughs> to wash away any remaining light sensitive silver. And then the plate is washed with water. And sometimes a solution of gold chloride is mixed and poured over the plate to bring out different tones. An important thing to note is that the plate that's exposed in the camera is the same surface that the image is on, so that the daguerreotype plate was in the same space as the person or scene being photographed, which is truly remarkable. It's as though the person's presence or energy is there in your hands as you look at it, and that's very distinctive to daguerreotypes. Next slide. The process produced an image with a surface that was so fragile, though, that it could be easily marred or damaged, so there had to be protective housing. Um, decorative wooden cases covered with embossed leather, um, and in later years, um, thermoplastic. Uh, the one on the lower left there is actually plastic, although it's, I'm sure it's hard to, to distinguish it between the others. Um, it was more affordable, um, to, and, and, those, and that became more common. Um, we often refer to daguerreotypes for this reason as cased objects because of this. And the image on the right, you can see the inside layers of the case with the red velvet lining, and then the plate with the image on it, then a brass mat, then it's covered with a piece of glass, and then a thin brass strip known as a preserver helps hold it all together. And then the next image. So it opens like a book, revealing this image within. And as you can see, these were very intimate private objects meant to be appreciated individually. They were produced in standardized sizes, ranging from mammoth plates and whole plates 
to sixth, ninth, and sixteenth plates. So you, when you hear people um, talk about daguerreotypes, they'll often refer to sizes in those terms. Um, a sixth plate was the most most common size, and these smaller sizes, um, the sixteenth, ninth, and sixth plates, um, the daguerreotype was the most affordable in those sizes. Typically, an average portrait sitting costs between five dollars and fifteen dollars for a whole plate, just to give you a sense. But then fifty cents for a sixth plate. Next slide. So early photograph studio, photographic studios were often situated at the very top of a building, um, which had a glass roof, so you could let in as much light as possible. And these are just some illustrations to give you a visual. Um, the subject you can see is sitting on this posing chair that's raised, um, that's put on a raised platform, and that could actually be rotated. On the right, you can see the sitter's head was held still by a clamp or heavy iron headrest, which you can see here. Um, it's often why many sitters in early photographs appear really stiff and without um, an animated expression, in part because they're attached to this really uncomfortable device. Uh, it was also they wouldn't move and cause a, a blurry image. Next slide. So just to give you some examples from the Huntington's collection, which we have over 70 daguerreotypes, um, here are two where you see everyday folks in, in a family portrait on the left, as well as important figures on the right in society and culture. Um, those sitting for daguerreotypes made choices about what to wear, what studio to go to, how large they wanted their portrait to be, how, and, and also in terms of what they could afford. Um, even the type of case could be tailored to their um, needs. Now, the daguerreotypist made decisions about lighting, posing, and the use of props. Um, some would even write um, lengthy descriptions or recommendations about what mental state you needed to be in before the session. I'm assuming a good state, <laughs> a happy state. Um, on the right is the famous author Edgar Allan Poe, which you'll um, be seeing again in Suzanne's presentation right after this. Poe actually wrote an essay um, in 1840 on the subject of daguerreotypes, interestingly enough, and he was just like many entranced by the medium to the point where he, he quote said, this is the most important and perhaps most extraordinary triumph of modern science. So there are a total of eight original um, known daguerreotypes of the image of the likeness of Edgar Allan Poe um, that have been authenticated. And interestingly enough about the Huntington's version is that it is a daguerreotype copy of one of those original daguerreotypes. So there's been some interesting research done on this one. Next slide. Here are two striking portraits in our collection of Dwight Plimpton Conklin, who was a California settler and gold rush miner, and his wife there on the right. And I put this up just so you can see some of the um, additions of color to these uh, plates. You can see the blush of the cheeks on the left there, and then the gold paint on the right um, to embellish some of her jewelry. This was a common practice to enliven the portraits. Next slide. Here are a couple of details. Again, just so you can see this crisp clarity of the daguerreotype, but also to see a little bit more about how these um, colors would have been applied. Um, a separate colorist often would apply this dry powdered pigment to the image with a fine paintbrush. And it's said that breathing gently on the plate would make the dry powders adhere more readily. And again, I just love that idea that it gives you a sense of the intimate gestures involved with making these objects as much as viewing them. Next slide. While portraiture is some of the most common, there are also other landscape and building scenes captured by daguerreotypes. The Gold Rush is a great example. Um, this was the first major event in the country to be documented extensively through daguerreotypes. For instance, in our collection, we have this outdoor view of a street in a mining town of Humboldt County, California. And the next slide. And here are two different groups of miners um, posing. Uh, sometimes, although unfortunately not in these examples, but sometimes the photographers would hand paint gold dust or gold nuggets um, on the plate itself to, um, to show what, the, what they had uncovered. Um, there's also been some new research um, that's interesting on the connection between precious metals like silver and gold and early photography. I think there's something compelling about daguerreotypes relying on silver to be made, then at the same time depicting the search for gold and prosperity in America. Daguerreotypes were the most popular from 1839 to 1860 until they were replaced ostensibly by less expensive amber types and tin types. Um, these are other cased um, object type of um, photographs, as well as by glass negatives that provided the ability to make multiple prints from one negative. Next slide. So today, I would say only I would say a handful, <laughs> uh, but I think it is growing 
of specialists um, create daguerreotypes. You have to be really committed. It's very expensive. It's very difficult. Here are two such determined individuals, Robert Schleyer on the left and Bin Don on the right, uh, whose works we are proud to have in the Huntington's collection. Robert Schleyer has been exploring America's Western landscape, retracing the steps of early photographers who documented these 19th century expeditions. Um, when he's asked about his occupation, he calls himself a visual historian of Western exploration and says that he is specializing in the year 1853. Bin Don, um, on the right, immigrated to San Jose from Vietnam with his family in 1979. And for over a decade, he's traveled across the American West, making daguerreotypes in a mobile darkroom that he calls affectionately Louis, named after, of course, Louis Daguerre. And he uses this historical process and these iconic views to negotiate his connection as a Vietnamese American with the landscape and the history of the United States. Next slide. So both artists have been deeply inspired by photographers such as Carlton Watkins on the left and Ansel Adams on the right, who are well represented in our collection. The photographs of Watkins and Ad Adams were instrumental in the establishment and promotion of national parks. And in fact, Bin Don says that he first became familiar with Adams when he saw the photographs of the Yosemite National Park on calendars that hung in his family shop. Next slide. Schleyer, um, these are some examples of his work here, taught himself how to make daguerreotypes and hand-built the equipment for preparing and developing them, as well as handling the toxic chemicals. And as I said, here are some works by him, and you can see he uses these rounded vignettes to evoke early photographic formats, including this on the right, this wonderful group portrait of Huntington employees, uh, which was taken in the Japanese garden. And I've heard, I was not here at the time, but I've heard it was very exciting to pose for. It apparently took several attempts and he'd go in and out of his, uh, he also had a kind of mobile dark room with all sorts of sounds and shuffles, um, probably some frustrations um, and a lot of people probably holding their breath, but you can see um, the, the result here. Next slide. And finally, these two daguerreotypes by Bindan feature Yosemite views, um, the falls on the right and then uh, the tunnel view on the left. The falls offers a traditional perspective of the landscape, whereas the tunnel view parking lot reveals the ways in which tourism has really changed the site over the years. You can note especially these wild blurs and movement um, and, no, and the no parking sign on the pavement. Don notes that as a refugee, the outdoors and camping were not familiar activities, and these felt very much like spaces for white Americans at leisure. He's also thinking about how other Asian Americans related to the land, including Chinese laborers who built the railroads and worked in the mines in this part of California, and whose presence has been largely ignored in a lot of historical accounts. So we are especially pleased to have these as recent acquisitions to the collection because it really adds to and complicates the dialogue about American landscape photography. So as you see, uh, daguerreotypes continue to mystify, perplex, fascinate, um, and create different levels of complexity, both materially and conceptually, um, and are still very much relevant to our world today. So now I'm going to introduce or to pass the mic over to Suzanne Odie. Thank you. Thanks, Lindy. Next slide, please. Okay, hi, I'm Suzanne Odie. I'm a processing archivist for visual materials here at the Huntington. Next slide. Well, what does a processing archivist do? I'm responsible for the arrangement, description, and proper housing of archival materials for storage and use by researchers. I primarily work with historical photographs of which we have many formats and types, depending on when the photographs were made, by whom, and for what purpose. For example, here you see rows of glass lantern slides on a table when I was in the stage of identifying and organizing them. Once I organized them, I placed them in envelopes that went into archival boxes with labels. All of the visual and physical information is then described in a catalog record and a finding aid that is discoverable online. Next, please. So you might wonder how would a researcher know that we have daguerreotypes here at the Huntington? Well, here's an example of a catalog record I wrote for a daguerreotype portrait of Jane Thoreau, who was the aunt of author Henry David Thoreau. The catalog record is made up of structured information that provides access points for online searching and retrieving, such as names, dates, words, phrases, and types of material. 
This catalog record is discoverable by searching a number of ways. You could search for Jane Thoreau, you could search for Henry David Thoreau, or search for photographs or daguerreotypes. The catalog record can also give context and background as this summary explains how this daguerreotype was received with correspondence from the Ward family of Massachusetts who were friends of the Thoreaus. Next, please. The Jane Thoreau daguerreotype is part of our larger collection of cased photographs and related images, which includes 72 daguerreotypes and other images. For collections of photographs, I create not only a catalog record, but a more in-depth guide to the collection called a finding aid that is hosted online on the Online Archive of California, or OAC. The finding aid is structured according to national archival standards to help users navigate the contents of a collection and identify items relevant to their research. It describes the history of a collection, the arrangement of the items, and provides a kind of inventory that identifies the contents of boxes, folders, and items within a collection. This finding aid contains a description of each daguerreotype and all the other photographs in the collection. Next. Of course, some of you may remember, before we had online catalogs in the internet, archivists and catalogers created catalog cards for archival materials and kept folders and binders of background information. But you had to be at the library to look at the uh, card catalog. I referred to the information in these cards and files to create the finding aid that is now uh, available online to anyone. Next, please. So when I'm cataloging daguerreotypes, I look for any textual information that might be on the case or in the frame. In this daguerreotype, the photographer left a stamped imprint in the lower left corner of the brass mat that I could read using a magnifying glass. If you can make it out, it says Whitney ROCH New York for Rochester, New York. I then was able to use published reference books of 19th century photographers and daguerreotypists in particular to discover this was taken by Edward Tompkins Whitney at his studio in Rochester, New York. I was also able to estimate when it was made to between 1845 and 1858 because those were the years he practiced in Rochester. Next, please. Here is a photograph I found that was taken by Whitney of his gallery on State Street in Rochester. In the center of the photograph, it's a little difficult to read, but there's a sign above the window on the third floor that says Whitney's daguerreotypes. This could very well be where the woman in the previous slide with the hoop earrings arrived in a horse-drawn bug buggy and went upstairs to sit for her portrait. And now let's go into the archives and look at some other daguerreotypes from our collection. This is the compact shelving where we keep most of our photo collections. The daguerreotype case image collection is kept down here in the last aisle. And here in these individual boxes made by our conservation lab. These boxes were made in about 1988 or so, and there was a big project to rehouse them all in individual boxes and to clean them. So most of these were opened up, taken apart, and the glass was cleaned, not the image. They didn't touch the image itself, but the glass and dust and to see if there was anything underneath the image in the case. Sometimes there were notes or writing or a silversmith hallmark that uh, would tell you something about the photograph. This is a key to the cased images color coded by whether that it's a daguerreotype an ambrotype, which is another early format of a photograph on glass in a case, or a tintype, which um, many tintypes weren't in cases, but these are tintypes that were cased. 
So as you can see, the boxes are color coded as to whether they were one of those formats. So this is a special daguerreotype in a box and it's of Edgar Allan Poe. Uh, this was a portrait of Poe taken in Richmond, Virginia. It was taken just a few weeks before he died. He left Richmond and went to Baltimore and he never left Baltimore. He died in a hospital. And there are several other daguerreotypes of Poe, um, but this one was purchased by Henry Huntington in 1911. And I like to think about Henry Huntington held this in his hands and probably really admired it and looked at it uh, being a famous picture of a famous person. This is the protective case. The daguerreotypes had class to keep it closed. And inside, this, this case has had a little repair work to keep the binding intact. And this is a gold miner, John B. Colton, who came with a group from Illinois. They left Illinois in 1849 to look for gold out west. And this photograph was taken in 1850 in San Francisco. He had his photograph taken. And there's an interesting story about this, that because he was so thin, th this photograph, and for other reasons, it was mistaken for a girl miner for a long time. And after he had the photograph taken, the photographer made his own copies and sold them for five dollars a piece advertised as a woman miner. This one had a piece of paper and a lock of hair inside of it. And this was found inside the case. This one the binding is broken. But we presume that this is this woman, it looks like her name was Abigail Cummings, 1852, and that was a lock of her hair. This is a beautiful little box. Again, leather. And the image is in very good condition. Here's a few other daguerreotypes. This is the a stereograph daguerreotype. We don't know who the man is, but this case is very unusual because it has a fold-out viewing mechanism in which you're supposed to look through and see a stereo image which is two images slightly different from one another that form one image with your eye when you look through. And there he is looking at me with his finger aside his head and it is much brighter. The glass is perfectly good. This was a patented invention by a company. I'm not sure how well it did. I haven't seen very many of these, but this is a very unusual case. And you can see there are two images. And that just like a stereograph print, except these are two daguerreotypes. This one I like because it's a nice clear image of a 15 year old, believe it or not. He looks older than that. He's very uh, self-possessed. And I like it because his name is written inside, possibly by him or relative. It says Theodore D. Judah, 1841. And that's one thing about daguerreotypes. There wasn't anywhere for someone to write their name or the date. Like a lot of 
albumen cabinet photographs we have. Somebody has written on the back in ink the person's name and identification, but there's nowhere to write anything. This is just a an old uh, collection sticker. And so sometimes notes were underneath, and then sometimes people just wrote right in the case, and I'm grateful for those people because that's very helpful and the date not only the name but the date thank you for watching i'm going to introduce now my colleague jessamy glore all right thank you so much suzanne uh, so here at the huntington oh actually i'm ready for my next slide thank you um, here at the huntington i look after the physical well-being of works on paper such as the Octavia E. Butler archives, drawings and watercolors by Turner and Blake, and our photographic collections. I'll be telling you about my role in this process and how we take care of daguerreotypes, as well as some common types of damage and how to identify them. I'll end with showing you how I clean the daguerreotypes when safe, which will lead into our final presentation. Next slide, please. First of all, what is conservation? I'm showing you a before and after treatment that I did of a glass plate negative, which has nothing to do with daguerreotypes. And um, please click one more time. And we should have revealed, this is the digital positive made from that negative, which is now freely available online of LA's original Chinatown. Um, so although physical treatment is the easiest part of conservation to illustrate, it's only one aspect. And at the heart of it, we're about helping voices from the past reach the future. We investigate how items are made and what they're made of and use this information to predict how they will age and what we can do or maybe shouldn't do to make them accessible now and for the next generations. We advise on how they can safely be seen, used and stored. And in this case, how to take the best images safely so that they can be shared with the world. Next slide. The first step is always is always examination. And here I was especially looking for any damage that I might be able to reverse to make the digital photos more usable. I was also looking for any weaknesses in the case structure so that I could find solutions to keep the daguerreotypes safe during imaging. Next slide. We also met as a group and discussed any potential difficulties in photographing these small objects. For instance, how to keep them safely open so the inside cover could be imaged, since most of the cases cannot be opened all the way. We happen to already have a cradle like this one on the left, left over from imaging miniature books, which worked well to hold these little cases, which are like miniature books, in place for photography. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to tell you about some of the most common condition problems in daguerreotypes, which give you clues to how they were made and to their individual histories. And in the lower left, for the next few slides, I'm including the example image of the parts of a daguerreotype from Lindy's presentation to act as a map. For the photo itself, since the image is only right at the surface, it's extremely vulnerable to scratching, as you can see here down this lady's face. Normally, the cover glass will protect the image, so I expect that this photo wasn't always inside this case, protected from scratches. It's even possible that since this photo was out of a case long enough to be this scratched, this isn't even its original case. Next slide, please. The most common problem is tarnish, and here's a very clear example. Since the image itself is made of silver, it can tarnish just like any other silver. To prevent this, the photographers back in the 1800s would seal the daguerreotype into a package using that preserver around the edges. But over time, air and pollutants will leak into the image. This tarnish can theoretically be removed, but it's quite risky because all the image is contained in just this very thin layer of silver at the top. So common practice now is to just leave well enough alone. And in fact, new scientific techniques can help see past the tarnish. To prevent it from getting worse, a photoconservator will reseal the package around the edges. 
Now, I also want to point out, you can just maybe make out these very thin horizontal lines, which look almost like scratches. I've indicated a few using horizontal yellow lines. But unlike in the previous slide, the image itself here is fine. These are not damaged. These are actually original polishing marks from when they first made that hand polished silver surface. So keep an eye out for them on other daguerreotypes. Next slide, please. Now remember the daguerreotypes are just a thin silver layer over a piece of copper and the copper can degrade too. In extreme cases, you may even see the copper underneath the silver corroding and this will be usually present as these green copper corrosion spots. This is usually a sign the item was in a high humidity environment in the past. Since we do have a stable environment here at the Huntington, it should keep the spots from getting worse. And again, you might just be able to make out the horizontal polishing marks from its creation. And next slide, please. So moving away from the photo itself, other very common damage is just wear and tear from handling. On the cases, sometimes the hinges or clasps are broken, or as you see here, the corners have been damaged, exposing the wood inside on this leather case, um, or sometimes the plastic cases will crack. For our library items, most of this damage has happened before the item reached the library, and the damage tells a story about how the item was used and cherished. Next slide, please. One final common type of deterioration for daguerreotypes and other cased photos is glass disease, which affects the glass cover. This image is from the Beinecke at Yale, and sometimes you'll see the cover glass start to become hazy and in extreme cases form droplets, sometimes poetically called weeping glass. Um, this seems to be caused by poorer quality glass that's been stored in a high humidity environment, and the salts seem to leach out of the glass and form alkaline drops. If these drip onto the image, it can cause irreparable damage to the photo surface. The glass can be cleaned, but the problem will usually eventually return, so it may be best to just replace the glass altogether. Next slide, please. So now you have an idea of some of the most common problems. How do you keep them from getting worse? An important step to keep a daguerreotype safe is to keep it in a high quality box, which is past the photographic activity test and keep that box in a stable environment. So in a home environment, that's going to be the most comfortable room in your house and away from any sources of humidity. And the other main way to prevent damage is to limit handling. This is where this digitization project that we did for these daguerreotypes actually comes in. Instead of straining the fragile hinges every time someone wants to see the image, they can see the photographs online from almost anywhere in the world and zoom in much more easily than in person. It's also much easier to compare two images side by side. So this means even though the process of photographing them is really more strain on the collection than if we just left them alone in the dark, the long-term benefits are great. Next slide, please. I'm happy to say the items in this collection didn't need much physical preparation for imaging, generally just a light dusting or sometimes cleaning the outside of the glass. Remember, Suzanne mentioned that back in the 80s, they were all taken apart and the glass was cleaned. And because the items are quite small, any little piece of misplaced dust can make the sitter look like they have a mole that they never had because we take such high quality photos, the dust is just magnified. Um, so I'm going to show you a short real time video of the cleaning process for the outside of the glass and talk over the top of it. Video please. All right, so here's a confession. This is actually an amber type on glass. We haven't talked about them, not a daguerreotype but it's the same cased image, which is why you can see the portrait so easily. It's not a mirror, but it's the same process. So I'm examining for any debris that we might be able to remove off of that cover glass. And I'm getting a piece of cotton just lightly damp with an ethanol and deionized water mixture and going in and just cleaning the glass. It is crucial that none of the cleaning solution leak under the edges of the preserver. It is metal, it will corrode. So we've got to keep that dry under there. And I haven't edited this, this video at all. This is all real time, so bear with me. And now I'm drying the glass. Final drying with just some more cotton. Once again, this is just the glass cover. If I did this to the image itself, there might not be much left. All right, getting him nice and dry, ready for his photo. 
and dusting off any little fibers that are left behind. One final examination with a bright flashlight. And he's looking nice for his photo. Just getting some fuzz off that velvet lining. The velvet really attracts fuzz, as you can imagine. And there you have it. After this, I'll put it back in its box and make some notes for the photographer and for any future conservation. Thank you. So I hope you've enjoyed learning about the stages in preparing daguerreotypes for photography, as well as the basics for spotting some common damage like scratches, tarnish, corrosion, and general wear and tear, as well as how we take care of them, mostly keep them in a nice box in a good environment. So for me, the daguerreotypes then traveled to photographer Ibarian X. Parello, who has made a video for you about photographing daguerreotypes. Thank you very much and enjoy. Each photographer at the Huntington Library has a workstation where they produce most of their work. This is mine, and it's where I've created thousands of photographs of items in our collection, including letters by George Washington, the notebooks of science fiction writer Octavia Butler, and, as I'm about to show you, daguerreotypes in our collection. We adhere to the Federal Agency's Digital Guideline Standards, or FAGI, for digitizing historical, archival, and cultural content. This provides a consistent method for ensuring a true representation of the object being photographed in terms of color, tonality, details, and exposure. Using the photo editing software Capture One, I use the color bar to create an initial image that I adjust for exposure and white balance. I then create what's called an LLC profile, which produces a neutral starting point that corrects for slight variations of color or lighting. The data is also used by a software called the Golden Thread, which evaluates files to see how well they meet the FAGI standard. As a result of our workflow, we consistently meet the highest FAGI rating standard of four stars. The daguerreotypes I recently photographed arrived in these custom protective cases, and I have to say that it felt like Christmas every time I opened up a new box. I had no idea what kind of image I would see and have the chance to photograph. Each case has a given number, and as you can see, there's great care and craftsmanship that goes into each. I photographed approximately 200 daguerreotypes for the PhotoDag project, all of varying sizes. Remember that photography was still in its infancy when these images were made. So there was no consistent standard for size, such as a 4x6 or an 8x10 that some of you may remember when you actually printed photographs rather than leaving them on your phone. This particular daguerreotype is a good example of what I photographed for the project. The image was enclosed in a protective case, usually made of leather, and secured with a metal clasp. Now we created a special support stage to hold up the case as we photographed it. A little strip of plastic with Velcro on each hand created a secure hold without applying any weight or pressure that might damage the item. I then bring in the color bar, which will be photographed along with the daguerreotype. This provides me a reference for checking color and exposure and is useful to anyone who eventually looks at the image and is concerned with color accuracy. The camera rig is motorized, allowing me to lower or raise the camera by depressing the buttons on this controller. I'll adjust this to compose the image within the camera frame. The initial exposure and color look good. I'll zoom in to ensure that the image is in focus However, the contrast of the portrait is reduced because of the glare. The remedy for this is a process called double polarization. It begins with a polarizing filter that's attached to the lens. This works much like a pair of polarizing sunglasses. They bend the light rays to remove glare and increase contrast. This process requires polarizing gels that are applied to the front of the strobes. The use of the filters cuts down on the amount of light. So to compensate, I increase the strobe's output to compensate for that light loss. The degree of polarization changes with each rotation of the filter ring. The slightest turn of the ring changes the amount of polarization. As these images demonstrate, the process makes the images darker and reduces glare. But I'm looking for an effect that reduces glare without making the image significantly darker, resulting in a color shift. I normally work with a second screen, allowing me to preview the effect as I rotate the filter, but I'm showing you each capture for this demo to illustrate the impact of double polarization. 
As you can see from the first to the final image, the overall look isn't dramatically different, but the portrait possesses greater contrast and detail. When everything leading up to the capture is done properly, there's little more that needs to be done in post-processing. I'll make sure that the daguerreotype is straight. Next, I'll check the exposure and make any necessary adjustments. The adjustments I made here are very slight, but bring me closer to the value of the color bar. I may tighten up the composition using the crop tool, and because of the camera's high resolution, even an aggressive crop would still produce a file where you could output a 20 by 30 print or even larger. The high resolution file allows you to magnify the image and see really fine details, including the coloring of the cheeks, still present after all these years. Everything has been done with a RAW file, the image produced straight out of the camera. However, for the image to be stored and shared, it has to be converted into another file format, such as a JPEG or a TIFF. A JPEG is like an MP3 for music. They are both compressed to make the file smaller. TIFF files are much bigger, as they prioritize image data over file size. As a result, TIFFs are the standard for purposes of archiving. And from this archive file, someone can create a small JPEG for email or posting on a website, or they can use that TIFF file to produce an exhibition quality print. And as you can see, the final result reveals the beauty of the daguerreotype that can be enjoyed and appreciated by anyone around the world. Okay. Thank you so much to all of our great panelists. And now we've got some questions to get to. Um, I'm also going to drop a link to our LibGuide in the chat right now, um, which will include some of the information that's already been covered, um, including um, some of the links to daguerreotypes in the Huntington's collections and also some resources. And eventually the recorded video of this program will be there as well. Um, but let's get to some questions. And um, We've got Suzanne and Jessamy and Lindy all here. And um, first, I think a lot of people are really curious um, in this presentation, why a lot, why none of you are wearing gloves? Maybe all of you could speak to mm -hmm. that. <laughs> um, I'm happy to take that one first, since I was the one wearing gloves, um, because I was dealing with the ethanol and water solution. So basically, you do not want to touch metal. Because these are cased photographs, the photo is encased in wood and a lot and often kind of flaky leather. So the advantage of not wearing gloves is it gives you more dexterity, especially for those tiny little hinges. Um, so if you're going to be opening the items, it's better to not have gloves. But if you're going to be touching any metal, you should be wearing gloves. Hope that helps. That's my point of view. Great. Anyone else want to weigh in on that? Uh, I'll just say too, I um, concur with Jessamy. If you're holding gloves, if you're wearing gloves, it's you can't open the clasp very well on the daguerreotype. And we, of course, always be sure we clean our hands carefully before handling and uh, we don't handle them too long. But um, yeah, it's not necessary to wear gloves just to open the case. Great. Um, so we have a couple of questions dealing with storage. And um, first of all, why the daguerreotypes are stored upright and also just the types of containers that they're stored in. Someone wants to get yeah. into that. I'll um, say something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'll just say, well, most of them are stored flat in a flat box. Um, the ones in the video that we were showing you that were stored vertically, they are in custom made boxes, so they fit very snug around the, the case and it can't move within the box. So it's very secure and safe. Um, we wouldn't have it, you would never have it in a loose box where it might tip one way or the other. Uh, Jessamine, what do you think about that? Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to say. And you might have noticed in the video, those are mostly smaller ones. So they're all in these very custom made boxes so that they would fit on the shelving 
that we happen to already have that was designed for books. Um, and then in terms of the box itself, I think we have a link in the lib guide. Oh, thank you, Kelly, <laughs> um, to where you can buy just really high quality boxes. They're not that expensive, believe it or not, custom made. Um, and the really important thing is to have no acids in there and especially no sources of sulfur. Um, so I would put it in a box, keep it in a stable environment. If you have a um, small collection of other things, definitely keep it away from anything rubber that could off gas sulfur. Um, but basically its own box is your first step. Um, I see someone asked about whether to have like activated carbon scavenger. It's kind of tricky because it's not just the silver itself is a very thin layer, but you also have the box, which is wood or plastic and is also can also be degrading the item. So I think your first step is make sure it's sealed and then um, put it in a good box. Great, thanks. Just me. Um, we've got another question about families that don't want to hang on to their own daguerreotypes and where should they look to donate them? Um, so maybe Lindy could talk about that a little bit. Sure. So, yeah, I think they asked also um, about conservation for daguerreotypes and maybe also just me could answer that part of it. But um, we do consider uh, daguerreotypes, of course, as they come through and evaluate them um, for connection to our existing collections and whether um, they fit within the scope of our collecting areas, um, as well as condition issues. So we would probably work with um, with just me as things come in, um, whether through donation or purchase um, to really evaluate um, whether we can uh, bring something into the collection. In the case of the new daguerreotypes that um, Ben Don, for example, or Robert Schler make, um, those um, don't have as many necessarily condition issues per se in terms of the, uh, in terms of, in relation, I guess, to earlier historic material, um, but they are still very precious and fragile. <laughs> so that is something to, we, we take into consideration as we're taking material in. Great. Um, there's also a question about, uh, and um, Lindy, I believe you did mention this in your presentation a little bit about the use of color and, and how the color was actually achieved in daguerreotypes. Yeah, so as I showed in some of the uh, slides, they would use a, basically a, a pigment um, that was uh, kind of like a powder. They actually had um, daguerreotype color kits, which is kind of cool. There's some fun fun examples out there where you can kind of see um, the different color of pigments that were available. Sometimes there were uh, specific ones available just for to replicate the gold of jewelry, which is like a gold leaf was was put into the kits and then they would be able to apply it with, uh, like I said, a very fine um, paintbrush. Um, and um, to get it kind of more, to, to have it adhere, I believe there was kind of a, a sort of a gummy a substance that was put on and they were that's what I was saying like when they would sort of breathe on it it kind of made it a little bit more tacky in order to hold the pigment um so I I also I am always amazed when I see the blush on the cheeks because you can see the skill of like being able to blend that so nicely <laughs> um so I know that that was um that, that was a very specific skill to have great um, there are a couple questions too about uh, exhibiting daguerreotypes and also just coming to the Huntington to look at our daguerreotypes. Uh, so maybe all of you could speak to that. So Suzanne. I can start with the, oh, no. <laughs> go ahead, Suzanne. I was just going to say um, people are, yes, you could technically come see a daguerreotype at the Huntington. You go to our reader services uh, department. There's an uh, email link in this chat, possibly, or on our website. Um, it's on the libguide. It's on the libguide. Mm -hmm. And um, you do need to get permission from the curator. So, Lindy, you can take it from there. Yeah, so depending on the research that's needed um, and the necessity of seeing something, in person, um, I usually evaluate each request on uh, just case by case basis. And then um, if it is 
really important to be able to see it in person. We usually grant the request and with all the different protocols that are um, followed in the reading room in terms of handling and, uh, and care, especially with something so fragile. And if you don't need to see it necessarily in person, that's why we also wanted to digitize the majority of our collection of cased objects, because it does make it um, so that there's less handling of this material over time when possible. And what is involved in actually exhibiting daguerreotypes? It seems there might be some special considerations around that. Yeah, I can take that one. Um, basically, they are light sensitive, so we can only show them for a short period of time. And the other half of it is more of a exhibit designer problem because you, they look like mirrors if you don't get the lighting just right. So it's a lot of creative lighting. Um, I've seen some really beautiful exhibits of daguerreotypes, but you have to be really know what you're doing with placing the lights. Yeah. Okay, and this is an interesting question about um, the cases, which we we saw a lot of in all of the presentations, and they, they are very important to um, keeping the daguerreotypes in good condition. And so there's a question about the conservation issues surrounding opening the actual cases, and um, also wondering if there is ever any information uh, regarding the sitter or the photographer uh, engraved onto the back of the plate. Yeah, um, Suzanne and I can op answer that one together. Basically, if you want to open it, make sure to have like a professional photo conservator open it for you and you can find one through find a conservator at um, culturalheritage.org. But um, Suzanne, yeah, can you tell people a little bit about yeah. some things you found? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't personally find them, but mm -hmm. in the 80s when they were opened, there were sometimes handwritten notes uh, and the lock of hair was really fascinating. Um, that was found behind the photograph in the case. Um, I did see one where there was actually a cut out newspaper advertisement for the studio that did the daguerreotype and that I don't know if the studio put that in there um, but that was interesting to find so I would say um, you know there's a a good portion of them have have had something or not or a small portion maybe let's say do have some sort of note or something uh, behind the case so it's great that they did do that big project to open them up and get that information out Hey, thanks, Suzanne. Uh, I know we didn't get to all the questions today, uh, but we are just about at time. Uh, so for those of you who did not have your questions answered, uh, we will follow up with you. Mm -hmm. And um, also in the chat, you will find the link to the companion research guide that has the link to reader services that Suzanne mentioned, which is another way to ask questions. And uh, eventually you will find the recorded version of this program there, uh, maybe in about a week or so. Uh, and some of your questions will be answered um, in the resources that are on the LibGuide. Uh, so thank you so much for turning, tuning into today's webinar, and we hope to see you at future multi-story library programs. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>